Good afternoon, everybody. Let's wait one minute so that everybody can join. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you to our second day of the webinar, What are Safe and Sustainable Flame Retardants? organized by PIMFA, the Phosphorus, Inorganic and Nitrogen Flame Retardant Association, a sector group within CEFIC. But before we start, I want to remind you that this webinar is organized over three different days. Uh, on June 27, on June 28 and on June 30, from 4 to 5 p.m. As you can see from the agenda, each day we will host different speakers. And today we have the pleasure of hosting Barton Finn, Purchaser Engagement Manager, Jonathan Claymark, Senior Chemicals and Business Advisor, and Peter Fisk, Managing Director. Before we go into deep dive, I would also like to make some recommendations. So please keep your microphones and camera off, should you wish to ask questions, please consider that there will be a specific time at the end of each presentation devoted to question and answers. You can post your questions in the chat and I will rely them to the speakers. In case due to time constraints, some questions cannot be answered. So don't worry because we will respond later by email. And please note that the event will be recorded and available later. In conclusion, I would like to remind you that questions about prices and production volumes are not allowed. And on that note, we remind you that this webinar is held under CEFIC competition law. At this point, I leave the floor to Adrian Beard, chairman of PIMFA, who will explain what PIMFA is. Thank you, Adrian. Adrian? I don't know. There are some connection issues. So I, I will go over. So uh, PIMFA is the phosphorus, as I said, uh, inorganic and nitrogen flame retardant association. It's composed by 30 members and is the manufacturers and users of three major technologies of non anogenated flame retardants. It was established in 2009 as sector group within CEFIC, the European Chemical Industry Council. PIMFA is also composed by PIMFA North America and PIMFA China. They are our sister associations. And PIMFA members take forward joint projects and action in the area of fair safety environment and eco labels rec recycling and communication and different application sectors so pimfa if you pimfa members are composed by uh, in are uh, composing uh, european union china and north america as you will see on the website you can reach out to, to us this is our team and in conclusion you can find us on social media on linkedin and twitter thank you very much for the attention so at this point, I would give the floor to Barton Finn. Uh, Barton Finn um, coordinates the European Union purchaser support and engagement activities of TCO development, the organization behind TCO certified, the world leading sustainability certification for IT products. So thank you very much, Barton, for joining us today. And at this point, I give the floor to you. Thanks, Francesca. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. So let's um, let's start. So um, hi, everyone. And uh, I'll start by thanking um, you, Francesca, Adrian, as well as PINFA in general for the invitation. Uh, it's much appreciated and I'm, 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 I'm really glad by, to have the opportunity to provide more information on what is TCO certified and how are uh, chemicals, including 
um, flame retardants tackled as part of our activities. Um, before jumping into the details, maybe a, just a quick introduction about uh, the organization I'm working for, which is TCO Development. So TCO Development is uh, an NGO based in Stockholm, Sweden, um, which is responsible for managing um, the sustainability certification called TCO Certified. So that's really um, what the organization I'm, I'm working for um, is, is focusing on. And then if we move to the next slide in order to introduce in a bit more detail what TCO Certified exactly is, as I said, Oh, and I realized that a part of the title is still in French. My apologies. But um, in, in, in a nutshell, what TCO Certified is, um, it is a sustainability certification for IT products. And that means that we focus our activities on doing two things. First of all, we develop what we call certification criteria. So these are, in fact, sustainability requirements or minimum sustainability performances uh, requirements that we develop and that we determine um, uh, in, in relation to IT products. Um, so these include, among others, some requirements about the use of chemicals and the type of chemicals that can be used in, in certified products according to TSA certified. So developing these requirements is the first part of our activity. And then the second part of our activity um, is connected to verifi verifying the compliance of the products uh, that are presented to us by IT brands. We check whether these products are compliant with the requirements that we have developed. And if we see that that's the case, then we issue a certain certificate which um, certifies that the product has been checked for complying with the different requirements that we have designed. So that's really in a nutshell what CISO certified is. Um, the certification has been out there for 29 years now. Uh, so we have around 29 years of experience in terms of certifying IT products. Um, the certification is fully compliant with the different requirements of um, the ISO 140 and 24 standards um, for type 1 eco labels, uh, which is the, 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 the most important standard when it comes to, 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 to the credibility and professionalism of, of eco labels. And nowadays, the certification is available for 12 product categories. Basic, basically, everything that is connected to the, the IT products that you find in the workplace, so computers, smartphones, tablets, um, printers and these kinds of, uh, of, of devices, um, but also the, the certification is available for data center products, um, so many servers. Um, and I've just checked and um, we today there are uh, around 27 brands that have at least one product certified according to TCO certified uh, and together these 27 brands, uh, they have around 2,500 uh, different products certified according to TC certified. If we move to the next slide, please, um, I'll quickly go back to the criteria. So these are the different areas in relation to which we develop uh, and we design sustainability requirements that we want to see and to push uh, toward the IT industry. Um, so on the right, you have an overview of the different areas that are being included in TCO certified in terms of requirements. Um, and obviously, um, chemicals um, is one of the area. Um, that um, that that is included in in in, in TCO certified. So, what I would like to do now is really to 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 kind of do a deep dive on this um, um, on this area to let you know first of all why we came up with a a framework for tackling the different chemicals um, and their risks uh, from a human health and perspective, um, but for tackling the different chemicals that were used uh, in product certified according to TCO certified, I want to give you a a better overview of what that framework is. Um, and then last but not least, um, I'm also going to provide a couple um, um, yeah, insights into some of the, the development areas that are, we are considering uh, to update that framework uh, in the future. So let's maybe start with um, the, first, um, the first point that I want to, to insist on, which is why did we came up? Did we come up with um, such a framework to tackle the different chemicals um, used in, in product certified um, according to TSA certified? And the reason why is connected to 
two key observations we had when we first launched um, the framework um, that we have um, uh, in relation to chemicals. Uh, so these two observations were one that uh, nowadays um, you have a vast amount uh, of chemicals that are present um, on the market. Um, we have estimated that there are uh, at least 350 um, uh, thousands uh, different chemicals available on the market. Um, and the first observation in relation to the magnitude of that number is that this makes it really difficult to manage uh, from a sustainability perspective uh, these different chemicals and the use of these different chemicals and the assessment of these different uh, chemicals that could be used in IT products. Um, so that was the first key observation we had. Just the number of, of chemicals uh, available and commercialized on, on the market makes it really difficult to manage uh, these chemicals from a sustainability perspective and the use of these chemicals from a sustainability perspective. So that was the first observation we had. The second observation we had um, was connected to um, the fact that the restrictive approach or the negative list approach taken by legislations was not doing its job properly. So um, when it comes to IT products, um, you have two important legislations, at least at the European level, um, which are basically providing a framework for what types of chemicals can be used in IT products uh, sold on the EU market. These legislations are called ROS and, and REACH. Um, and actually what these legislations are doing, uh, I'm simplifying here, but what these legislations are doing is to say, okay, this is the list of chemicals that we know are bad from a health or human or environmental perspective. And so this is the list of chemicals that you are not allowed to use um, in, in for products sold on the EU market. And then for everything else, um, then we don't have any data, so you can basically do whatever you want. And of course, the number of, the, of, of, of chemicals being banned according to Ross and to REACH is really, um, um, is really small, uh, to not say something else, in comparison to the, the number of chemicals um, present on, on, on the market. And so basically, in relation to that negative and restrictive approach, we have seen that this approach was not leading to the use of safer alternatives. And our experience has shown actually that um, sometimes alternatives to the substance that were banned, uh, according to Ross or to REACH, were used. And we found out after them, these substances, uh, these alternative substances being used, we found out that they were as bad as the one uh, the ones that they were supposed to 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 replace or sometimes uh, worse so we had really an issue with the, with this situation and and we really felt that yeah the, the logic taken by legislation was not complete in order to really make sure that we drive progress and that we make sure that safer chemicals are being included in in product certified according to TISA certified and so that is really why these two observations is really why we wanted to provide and to come up with a framework that was actually going to drive progress and to drive the use of safer alternatives um, in, in comparison with what the legislations um, have and, and are still doing. So if we go to the next slide, um, we have an overview of how um, the logic uh, of the framework that we have designed works. And so, the framework is called the TCO Certified Accepted Substance List. So that's the name of the framework that we use in order to manage different types of chemicals um, used in, in product certified according to TCO Certified. And as you can see on the on the bottom uh, below, you have the approach taken by legislations where substances are being used. And then without us having a lot of knowledge on their impacts from a health or, or environmental perspective, and then we find out that these substances are not as good as we as, as we thought, and then these are being banned and, and, and we need a new, uh, a new replacement. Instead of doing this, what we wanted to do with TCO certified and through the TCO certified accepted substance list was to say, okay, this is the list of substances that have been already assessed as safer in, in comparison with the substances banned by by Ross and by and by Reach, and so only these substances will be allowed to be used in certified products according to TCO certified. So here, the, the the whole idea is really to say, okay, prior to substance being used in products, we want to see and we want to have these substance 
um, substances assessed for their impacts on uh, human health in, in, in the environment. And if we see that the impact is better uh, in comparison to the to the substance banned by legislations, then these substances can be used in uh, in IT products. So that's really the the whole idea behind the TISO certified accepted substance list. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, yeah, just a, a couple more information about uh, the different building blocks uh, of that um, of that accepted substance list that um, that is included in TISO certified. First of all, it relies uh, for the uh, um, uh, in the hazard assessment um, of the different chemicals, uh, it relies on the, the framework that is um, uh, developed by Green Screen, which is a solution developed by the Clean Production um, Action uh, a Network, in which is basically a framework for hazard, uh, analyzing the, the, the hazardousness um, of, um, of, of chemicals. Um, and this framework provides a, a benchmark scoring to the different chemicals following their assessment and this scoring expresses um, to which extent um, the a substance is toxic or or has negative consequence for the environment or human health and or uh, the extent to which we have data about the impacts of, uh, of a particular substance and so you have different types of benchmark from one to um, to, to, to four. Um, and of course, the assessment as part of green screen has to be done by licensed um, 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 uh, profilers for the assessment of the of the chemicals. Um, in terms of history, um, well, we first launched the TCO certified accepted substance list in 2015. And there it was only focusing on the flame retardants that were being used uh, in product certified according to TCO certified. So currently we have um, yeah, 22 um, flame retardants listed um, on the on the TISA certified accepted substance list, uh, and half of these have a, a green screen benchmark three, um, which is quite good in comparison to two or one, uh, which is uh, worse from a um, in 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 the in the green screen terminology. Um, then we added uh, plasticizers in 2018, and so currently you have nine plasticizers listed. Here also half of these um, are um, uh, have a, a benchmark uh, three. And then in 2021, so in December of last year, we also extended the TISO certified accepted substance list to process chemicals. So these are mainly the cleaning solvents that are not used in the products, but as part of the manufacturing operations uh, across the supply chains. And um, yeah, currently we have 15 um, process chemicals being listed. Only two have a green screen benchmark tree since it's we've just added it. So we've seen a, a constant improvement in terms of the benchmark um, uh, through time. Uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, we're using a tool which is called the, the, the CPN uh, PCDC tool, which is basically a, a tool that helps us to, to identify and monitor the different types of chemicals uh, being used in, in factories um, uh, producing product certified according to TISA certified. And then if we go to the next and the last slide, I see that, it, oh yeah, I just wanted to give you a, an overview of what the list looks like. So the list is accessible on our website and basically that's what the, the, the list looks like. So you have the, the name of the substance, their cast number, the type of, um, of substance that it is, the, their benchmark and other types of information in relation to this, but I won't spend too much time on, on it. If we go to, to the next slide, uh, I'll use the last minute I have in order to just provide you a couple information and insights into the, the future development areas that we see and that we consider for um, updating the TCO certified accepted substance list in the coming years. Um, and so basically what we are considering for this um, is to um, require um, a benchmark three. So for example, Benchmark two, three, and four are accepted um, for the substances uh, on the TCO certified accepted substance list, and we are considering only allowing uh, benchmark three um, as of 2024 uh, for the non uh, halogenated flame retardants used in products. Um, 
still when it comes to the to the to, to the non-alienated flame retardants we are also considering uh, making it mandatory the TCA certified accepted substance list in the the flame re uh, flame retardants mentioned in that list we want to make them mandatory for all printed circuit boards um, in certified products um, so far it's only uh, it has only been made mandatory for the printed circuit board uh, the power unit part uh, sorry um, um, printed circuit boards and for 2024 we are considering uh, making it mandatory for all printed circuit boards um, in, 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 in certified products. Um, and then last but not least, when it comes to, um, to uh, still um, non-alienated flame retardants, we also want to make it mandatory, the ones that are mentioned on the TC certified accepted substance list uh, for power cables, um, which have been exempted um, so far. Um, and then, yeah, when it comes to um, to, to plasticizers, um, something that we are considering here um, is to introduce a, a criterion connected to um, yeah the concept of PVC free cables. Where we are currently doing some research on on the different types of plasticizers that could be used as um, as alternative to 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 to, to PVC. Um, in order to make it mandatory uh, also as part of the of the of the products um yeah and um i'll stop there um yeah i'm one minute over so yeah and if you have any question you have my contact details here so feel free to to, to just reach out to me or add me on on linkedin and we can get in touch thank you very much barton for your interesting presentation so we have a question here so allowing only benchmark three in future is a very demanding requirement. So will exceptions be granted in difficult cases, perhaps on a temporary basis? Yeah, it's a good question. And I mean, uh, I, we know that it's a, a kind of a big ask, um, but I, on the other hand, that's also what we are here for. And that's part of the mission of uh, behind TCO development. So we want to push for improvements. Um, so that's the first thing that I have to say in relation to this. But uh, as I mean, as we've always worked that way, we are kind of practical and we are solution oriented. So whenever we we see that there are there is really an issue that would make it not possible uh, for different types of of reasons, of course uh, we can we can think of 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 how this can be can be managed but the the idea at least in general of course that there, there could be exceptions i'm not promising anything of course but um we've always been practical on on that but um the idea is to go and to push uh, for uh, a general a general generalized um a benchmark three requirement um, with some degrees of exception uh, being provided as we if we consider that it's it's needed and, and relevant Thank you very much, Barton. So I see that on the chat there are other questions, but we will reply uh, after via emails because we have to move forward with the other speaker. Thank you very much again. And I would like now to give the floor to uh, Jonathan Claymark. So welcome, Jonathan. Um, a brief introduction. So at ChemSec, he leads the work with uh, the ChemSec business group as well as being responsible for the PFAS focus, including PFAS movement and identification of safer alternative, and is project manager for, uh, for ChemSec Marketplace. So welcome and thanks a lot for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Um, so we can take the next slide. Um, so as we said, my name is Jonathan Claymark and I come from ChemSec. And today I will share the view of ChemSec regarding safe and sustainable in reference to flame retardants and with the viewpoint from uh, ChemSec Marketplace. Um, so, but I would like to start with a few words regarding ChemSec. So if we take the next slide. Um, so ChemSec is also a Swedish organization, a Swedish NGO. Um, we um, are focusing on chemicals and our view, aim is to reduce the use of hazardous chemicals in, in products. Uh, and we do our work in a few different ways. So we drive the political discussion on hazardous chemicals and we do this by influencing policymakers um, 
and I would say without, I'm a bit biased here, but I think that we are the most influential NGO uh, working on chemicals in the EU space. Um, but we also want to have the focus on the business uh, world. Uh, so what we want to do is to challenge companies to improve their chemicals management. And one way of doing this is through our business group, which is a group of, group of uh, multinational companies like IKEA, Lego, Adidas, Dell and Apple. Uh, which we work together with to, to understand challenges and solutions connected to chemicals issues. Um, in addition to this, we also want to be a bit more concrete regarding how we support the companies. And we do that by uh, having developed a set of online tools uh, which can help companies to switch to safer chemicals. Uh, two of these are Synlist and Marketplace, which I will talk about today uh, a bit later. Uh, and we also inform investors about risks and opportunities in the chemical industry, uh, mainly through our tool called ChemScore, where we rank chemical producers according to their production of hazardous chemicals, mainly. Um, and what we at ChemSec want to bring as an NGO is the positive side from, uh, the, from the business world. So we don't want to work or we do not work with name and shame. Instead, we want to bring positive examples from businesses and companies when we talk to policymakers, because we think that this is extremely powerful, showing that there are ways of having a, a progressive campus management and still being successful. Um, next slide, please. Um, just a brief uh, word on, on the hazard versus risk question. So uh, at ChemSec, we have a hazard based approach um, and I think that the, the main advantage of that and the, the main reason to why we have that approach is that uh, um, banning a chemical is the only way to be 100% sure uh, that it will not no longer pose a risk. Um, and even if hazard assessments are extremely complex to do, um, the exposure assessments will add a lot of new variables. and. And basically what you do when you add exposure uh, assessment is that you add the list of assumptions you're doing. Um, and it's extremely hard to make the possible exposures to a chemical throughout the life cycle from the workers to the use phase to the to the waste phase. Um, but of course, um, we, we know that um, re in, in some cases risk and exposure is necessary uh, to use, but from our point of view, uh, a hazard-based approach is the best way to assume uh, or to get a good driver for substitution. Um, next slide, please. But talking about our tools, um, so we have a set of tools. So today I will briefly mention SINLIST and Marketplace. Uh, so SINLIST, which stands for Substituted Now, is our list of substances to avoid. Um, and these are substances that we consider meet the uh, substances of very high concern criteria uh, from the REACH uh, legislation. Um, but since it's a political process to add chemicals to the candidate list, uh, we have made a sort of a future candidate list, added chemicals that really fulfill these criteria. Uh, so we have today around 1000 chemicals on the SIN list, and it's a, it's a great way to stay ahead of regulation uh, to understand which chemicals that you should not use as a company. But uh, apart from that, the SIN list, we're showing what you should not use. We also want to, to show what you should use. So therefore we have Marketplace, which is our business to business platform uh, for advertising safer alternatives to hazardous chemicals. Um, and regarding the, the criteria we have for what this is a safer alternative, we have basically the same criteria as for the SVHC, but we, add, we have added a few extras like PMT criteria, for example. Um, and we put the responsibility on the suppliers to make, to, uh, make sure for us that they fulfill the, these criteria. Um, and regarding the flame retardants, uh, Marketplace have a, a set of uh, our range of different flame retardants. And um, if you look at the data, sort of what uh, the search data and what uh, the, our users are interested in, we see that flame retardants is one of the most used search terms. It's also one of the used, most used uh, filters that we have. So it's a very high interest in flame alternatives to uh, to uh, hazardous flame retardants. And I think one can also say that there is 
uh, when we talk to companies, there is a, a very high acceptance uh, and interest in um, an understanding of that importance to have safer alternatives to hazardous flame retardants, because there is historically this has been an issue. Uh, so there is uh, among companies today very high uh, interest in finding alternatives to these uh, chemicals. Next slide, please. Um, so moving on then to talk about safe and sustainable and in connection to marketplace. So um, if we're talking about safe and sustainable by design chemicals, uh, this is a, a concept that's been um, launched within the chemical strategy for sustainability. Um, and it says in this chemical strategy that the substitution has not occurred at the expected pace. And one of the initiatives to increase the substitution pace is safe and sustainable by design. Uh, and there is a work right now, which we are a part of, to uh, um, define the criteria for the what is a uh, safe and sustainable by design chemical. And the idea with this is, of course, to support the transition to these safe and sustainable chemicals. Uh, and for us, this is, of course, interesting because we want to develop marketplace further to, to ensure that we can offer or we can show the availability of also the, the safe and sustainable uh, chemicals. Um, so for us, this is the sort of next step for marketplace. Uh, so next slide, please. But when we talk, so when we talk about safe and sustainable, uh, of course, we need to talk what is safety and what is sustainability. Uh, so if we start with safety, uh, at Chemsec, we have had a lot of discussions regarding what to, how to define what is a safe chemical. Um, and for us, safety is binary. It's either safe or it's not safe. So there is no gray zone uh, for this uh, variable. Uh, but we also consider that the, the SVHC criteria is not enough. Uh, we need sort of a wider approach necessary because there are other chemicals that are not SVHC chemicals, but still pose a risk or is still uh, hazardous. Um, so what we call these sort of, of chemicals of concern instead, uh, where we include both the SVHCs, but also a wider range of chemicals. And I've listed here, I know it might be hard to read, but I've listed the, the, the criteria that we want to include or the property that we want to include uh, to, in order to claim that a, a chemical is safe. So it's, it's an uh, extension of the SVG list of criteria. And I should add that if you have not um, investigated these properties, uh, it's, it should not be possible to claim that a, a chemical is safe. Uh, so you need to be able to show that these uh, um, criteria has been fulfilled in order to claim that it's a safe chemical. Um, next slide, please. So what about sustainability then? Uh, so if we now talked about safety, of course, we also want to talk about what is sustain sustainability and what is that part in safe and sustainable by design. Um, and our view is that we should focus on the on the most important variables, uh, the ones that where we have data and where we can see a difference between different products. Um, and for all, I listed uh, the parameters for sustainability that we want to include: uh, carbon uh, dioxide emissions, water use, waste, e impact on ecosystems and biodiversity, and basic social dimensions. Uh, and we think that for for all of these, we you need a, a minimum threshold. Uh, to reach uh, and to say claim that this is sustainable uh, or a safe and sustainable chemical. Uh, if it doesn't reach that threshold, it should not be considered safe and sustainable. And of course, we can have target values for all of these, so we can see how far away they are from uh, from reaching the different levels of compliance. Um, and we also think that, of course, these parameter values must be uh, updated over time because things will change regarding what we think should be or what the target values should be. Um, and it's also important to note that we think that if if we want to uh, include all of these parameters, we probably need to do that in a stepwise approach, um, maybe starting with the carbon dioxide emissions and water use, and then add the other ones as we go along. And we also have other uh, parameters that we can include in this um, in, in the criteria for safe and sustainable. But we need to do this in a way to make it uh, useful uh, for, for companies for, to understand if the chemicals and the products uh, are 
uh, safe and sustainable. Next slide, please. So now we talked a lot about what we think is safe and sustainable, but of course this is extremely difficult and there is a lot of challenges uh, to understand and to define criteria for this. Uh, for this. Um, I've listed a few of these challenges here. Uh, one of them, or I would say that the most important one is that it needs to be simple because that makes it useful. Uh, we can see in some other examples from uh, like example PEF, which is the uh, product environment uh, or environmental footprint, uh, which is has a lot of different variables based on an LCA. It, it's quite complex and very hard to use, which makes it a bit less useful. So we think that if we want to uh, have something called or claiming that things are safe and sustainable by design, it also needs to be simple to understand how they are and why they are that. Because otherwise it will be very uh, unuseful. Um, and of course, lack of data is always an issue when we talk about chemicals. Uh, and it's an easy issue, I would say, in all the value chains. Um, and it will be very difficult to conclude uh, the level of sustainability for chemicals if there are data gaps. And our view is, of course, if we don't have any data, it's, uh, it's very hard to set sustainability targets. And if we cannot to conclude anything on the sustainability, we cannot say if they are safe and sustainable. So we need data in order to see, in order to claim safe and sustainable. And we think that safe and sustainable by design should be a golden standard. It should show the direction. It should be a set of chemicals or similar that really are what where the direction we want to go and to clear, to see the to fulfill these criteria uh, and be the golden standard. And when we talk to, to companies like brands, they are looking for a seal of approval. Uh, that's what they need to do. They need, they need to know which chemicals they can use, which chemicals should be in their products. And they need someone else to, to show them that. And uh, safe and sustainable design can be a way of doing that uh, for these uh, companies. So I think that was my next slide. Uh, so I'll be happy to answer any questions if we have time for that. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So here I have a question so on the CAMSEC marketplace. So uh, do you have numbers on how successful this approach is? Have you measured how many of the searches for alternatives lead to actually using them? So this is a, a very good question. Um, so what, what we want to do on CAMSEC marketplace is to do the connection between the buyer and su the supplier. Uh, and we don't have uh, sort of a, a method to follow up uh, the, the sort of hit rate uh, we have. We can see how many how many views, page views. We can see how many contacts that's been made, but we don't follow up. What we do is that we follow up with uh, with our users, our suppliers, the, the companies that advertise on Marketplace uh, to understand how many of the, the contacts uh, they get and how many of those are successful. Uh, we don't have a specific number on that, but um, and I would say that substitution is a very difficult thing to do as well. It's what we, our part is the small part of understanding what is available alternatives. Uh, and then we have, a, there is a lot of work regarding if it's a substitution or if it's an alternative that can be used in the specific process. Uh, but I think that, um, I mean, I, I cannot give a number, uh, that's the simple answer, but what I can say is that there is a lot of connections being made, there is a lot of interest in all the alternatives, uh, but we cannot say exactly how many successful substitutions that have been made uh, due to Chemsec Marketplace. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And for all the other questions, uh, we will answer by email. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So at this point, I will give the floor to Peter Fisk. So Peter Fisk, uh, a brief introduction. His extensive experience covers topics like research into physical chemistry topics, physiochemical property measurements for regulatory submissions for general chemicals, petrochemicals and pesticides, and regulatory work on human and environmental risk assessment, and much more. So uh, thank you very much, Peter Fisk, and I give the floor to you for your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, 
Well, the previous two speakers came from a Swedish NGO. I have a Swedish name, but I'm not a Swedish NGO. Um, I'm going to be talking about organophosphorus flame retardants. Um, next one, please. This topic of grouping is uh, highly active in the, the levels of the Commission and ECHA and so on. Uh, you might wonder why has PINFA asked me? Um, they know that I had a, a long period of time working for regulators uh, and in consultancy on flame retardants, but interestingly, uh, none of the substances that uh, I will talk about today have I got any interest in. I did not submit the, the registrations for REACH or anything like that. Um, so, should we put all the organophosphorus flame retardants together in one big group or perhaps more groups or consider them individually? That's the question. Um, next, please. So I collected physicochemical, environmental health data from the uh, REACH registration documents that was provided by PINFA and also a certain amount of published material where uh, that was necessary and, and some um, predicted properties where that gave a, co a more coherent data set. And then I uh, wanted to look into are there structural subsets and do they relate to the hazard data? Next, please. So weight of evidence, this is quite important, really. Uh, the REACH dossiers collected according to the uh, Clemish 1 and 2 uh, standard for OECD or sim similar guideline methods are highly demanding, done uh, usually uh, in compliance with good laboratory practice, and therefore should have a very high weight of evidence in an exercise like this. And uh, the, there, are, there are a lot of data uh, on these substances out there, but from different labs in different methods and uh, very often not according to guidelines. And in my view, the guideline studies have higher weight. It's not that the others are disregarded, but uh, the, the dossiers themselves um, should have the most weight. And it's important to note for the data set I looked at, um, the uh, the registrants of the organophosphorus flame retardants did not need to use read across or grouping for the registrations to uh, to any significant extent at all. So they, they are data rich substances. That doesn't mean that every data point on every endpoint is known because um, at low tonnage you don't need to uh, measure some of the higher tier things. Next, please. So first, very simple conclusion. It does not make any sense as a scientist to me to group together uh, organophosphorus flame retardants into one single group because of the, uh, the different structures, the different properties, but crucially the different toxicological properties. There are not strong patterns uh, in the toxicology. Then you might see some effects of a certain type with some substances, different effects with other substances, but that doesn't mean that there's a common underlying similarity. The ecotox is uh, slightly different in that the very classical relationship between ecotox effects and the octanol water partition coefficient KOW is fairly normal, and that's uh, in a way reassuring. The environmental fate properties are very variable across the set. You do see some ready biodegradation and some substances that are not degradable at all. So again, there's no single pattern there. Next, please. Now, I started looking at structural subgroups and thinking uh, like a chemist, something I can't avoid. Um, there were uh, six fairly clear groups amongst the organophosphorus substances, at least structurally. And it's interesting to note that the chloroalkyl phosphates have already been grouped for risk management purposes by ECHA. 
next please this is one for the uh, for everyone that's not so familiar here's some sample structures of the kinds of things that we are talking about i'm not going to talk about these in uh, detail but uh, i'm sure that these talks will be available for people to look at um, later next please so we uh, pushed on further with this to look at the differences between the different uh, groups uh, or, or perhaps they turn out to be very similar and I used a, a method that's called the Hansen solubility parameter which is a, a physicochemical calculation that's been around for over 50 years that relates to the kinds of forces that exist between molecules and these are called dispersion polarity and hydrogen bonding in these particular molecules the hydrogen bonding is very similar across all so i didn't pursue that uh, very much now these lots of you will have heard about the physicochemical properties and how they relate to uh, chemical behavior um, the great thing about these HSP is that they are um, measurements that are absolute energies. They are not relative one to another. They are absolute uh, forces. Um, that's one for the chemists to uh, dwell on. Next, please. So this is a kind of uh, index for the graph that's following uh, of the various for the phosphate esters. Uh, and this you can look at at your leisure, but the graph is more communicative. Next one, please. So here, the different color of these spots represents each one is a substance. And uh, the different chemical types have been, uh, I've drawn them here with different colors. And so we can see on the far right, these are the uh, so-called bisphosphates. The ones at the top, the yellow ones, uh, these are uh, chloroalkyl. Now, our, our x axis here is the dispersion force, the y axis is the polarity. And uh, you might wonder, oh, is this very significant, these differences? In fact, almost every organic chemical, common organic chemical, could fit into this graph. Uh, so it's a very widespread of uh, energies and there's tens of thousands of measurements of this property available and you just search Hansen solubility parameter you'll find out how you can find get them and so we see here that the different chemical types are not just separated in terms of the structural description but they're actually separated in intermolecular forces which suggests that they are fundamentally different Next, please. Um, so as I've said, the structural groups are well clustered. And so I feel confident to push forward and say there are energetically significant separations. Um, and I then pushed on to look at the kinds of toxicology that exist in each group. Next, please. Those of you who are uh, awake, will know that I talked about phosphonates as well. And in this graph, the, there are four phosphonate flame retardants. Uh, some of these substances are uh, plasticizers so rather than flame retardants, but for the purposes of this talk, um, I've just called them all uh, flame retardants. The, uh, the, the blue ones are the, the phosphate esters you had before, and here the phosphonate esters are sitting in another space. They've got higher polar forces, uh, sitting next to the chloroalkyl ones uh, where there are high polar forces or, uh, compared to the ones lower down. So again, uh, a satisfying separation uh, and trying to achieve such a separation using other types of uh, physicochemical methods simply does not work. So uh, this is very powerful to me. Uh, next, please. So this is the conclusion slide you'll be pleased to know. And I hope I'm on time and it's time for some questions. Um, you cannot and should not scientifically group these 20 substances into one group. It's not good science. It makes no sense uh, to group together 
things that have got quite different toxicological properties. Within the structural groups, they're generally very consistent. I do note here one uh, difference, uh, one anomalous group. Um, so extrapolation between uh, subgroups is not uh, a good idea either. At the end of it, you could make a case to work with these structural groups. And as I said earlier, ECHA is doing that, the European Chemicals Agency, with the chloroalkyl group. Uh, you could make a case to go one substance at a time. And we'll see how this uh, plays out in future. And I, I think this is an interesting time to contribute to this question of grouping because for sure we need to, for example, reduce the timeline of regulatory work. We need to reduce the amount of animal testing uh, as well. But we also, I believe, this kind of analysis can point the direction for uh, less toxic substances to be developed. And uh, uh, I think we've heard something about that from the previous speakers and everybody knows that this is hard and we need clues as to which chemical directions to go into. But uh, I think the uh, for the third time, I'll say it's not effective to group all the substances uh, together because we could end up um, not having available to us effect substances that are very important could be ruled out for completely invalid reasons. And so um, I think that uh, that's my very clear uh, conclusion on having looked at this set in an independent minded way. So thank you all for listening. I hope it was clear enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for your interesting presentation. And I have a question for you. So could you please comment on how the grouping of organophosphate flame retardants compares to other chemicals like PFAS or uh, phthalates, please? Well, I think uh, I know there are one or two people on the call who, who have got a strong interest in PFAS and will know that uh, even 20 years ago, I did some work on those myself uh, under contract. I think for the PFAS, you've got one overwhelming property which is the huge uh, half-lives, the complete lack of degradation uh, that, that is, uh, as far as I am aware, for the low molecular weight uh, substances, you know, uh, the non-polymer PFAS, is a dominant property. There's going to be some differences in the polarity between sulfates or sulfonates or whatever that are attached to the um fluorinated chain but there you've got a strong and dominant property that every single member of that group possesses and that is why we all got these substances inside our bodies phthalates i think is a, a perhaps a different issue but with phthalates you you tend to see a uh, a common there is a common toxicological um, behavior um, in the uh, uh, not that I've studied the phthalates recently but my understanding is they all exhibit certain types of toxicology or certain type of toxicology so I think the OPFRs are different in that the pattern of toxicology degradation and physicochemical properties is not consistent across the whole set so I see that as a very different case Thank you very much, Peter. Adrian, do you want to say something? Yes, yes th th thanks. Um, I we see no further questions and, and we are close to the end of this session. So first of all, thank you very much for the three speakers of today for joining us. I had some internet issues earlier, so <laughs> apologies again, I couldn't speak to you. Uh, my name is Adrian Beard. I'm, I'm chairman of PINFA currently. And also a uh, warm welcome for me before I say goodbye. Um, also a hint to that now there's a one day break so you can recover from today and yesterday's presentations before hopefully
rejoining us on Thursday afternoon, same time, same place, on another set of three exciting presentations where we have um, Kem Forward joining us. We have um, two presentations from PINFA on the topic of durability versus persistence and, and the topic of recycling, which was also briefly mentioned in the chat today. So hopefully um, most of you will be able to, to join us again on Thursday for further insights from uh, PINFA, what we are doing on this chemical strategy for sustainability and safe and sustainable flame retards in the future. And with Chem Forward, also a, a group who will be joined, by the way, by um, Apple and Google uh, representatives to explain how the E&E &E industry is, is approaching the, the, the task of substituting um, problematic chemicals, in particular for flame retards in, in their products. So looking very much forward to, to those presentations as well. But again, big a big round of applause and, and thanks to today's speakers for giving us this brief update and overview on uh, TCO's thoughts, uh, a long-standing established organization and, and also established scheme to assess alternatives, which is has as a practical um, experience and, and traction as opposed to what uh, the European Commission is, is currently thinking of. It's still also, it's still early stages, still in development, but here is a, a system that already works. And, and then with, with Chemsec Marketplace, also something that is already out there that, that does work. It has limitations, of course, because uh, it, it has to be somewhat simplified and, and workable. And I only hope that also what the European Commission comes up with in, in, in this under the CSS will also be somewhat streamlined, workable, and as simple as possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, in addition to, of course, providing progress on the side of, of making chemicals more safer and, and sustainable for consumers and, and workers. And also thanks, Peter, for your contribution on, on this uh, aspect of, of grouping chemicals with the focus on chemicals that are, of course, of particular interest to, to PINFA. Here, the example of, of organic phosphorus-based uh, flame retardants, um, but this whole topic of grouping of chemicals is a general one that um, is also being applied to other chemicals for, for the understandable reason that, that to assess thousands of chemicals one by one just takes um, too long and then there needs to be some ways to streamline this. But um, our point or the point you made, Peter, was um, Yes, uh, streamlining is is a good idea and is feasible, but uh, you should also respect, say, scientific limitations or limitations in different chemicals. With that, thanks a lot, um, and hopefully see you again on Thursday afternoon. I hand over again to Francesca for also a closing word. Thank you very much, and I wish you a very nice end of the afternoon. See you on Thursday. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.